When it comes to quality sleep, Ashley has you covered with top mattress brands at winning prices and with special financing options available. You can snooze now and pay later. Plus, your mattress purchase helps give the gift of better sleep to children in need and U.S. Special Operations Forces. Visit your local Ashley store or shop online today and make every snooze count. Financing is subject to credit approval. See store or ashley.com for details. Rosetta Stone is the language learning program with a lasting impact. I've been using their app to learn French, and it's not just about memorizing words, but actually having real conversations. And it's not just French. They offer 25 languages. Right now, Rosetta Stone has an awesome holiday deal, 50% off their lifetime membership. Every language, unlimited access forever. For anyone keen on diving deep into a new language, check out rosettastone.com. It's a game changer. Welcome to True Crime Garage. Wherever you are, whatever you're doing, thanks for listening. I'm your host, Nick, and with me, as always, is a man that would like to remind you that Toby Flenderson is everything that is wrong with the paper industry. Here is the captain. Toby Flenderson to the principal's office. Your mother called. Seems like you went the bed again. It's good to be seen and good to see you. Thanks for listening. Thanks for telling a friend. Today, we are still in love with Hazy Jane New England-style IPA from the Master Brewers over at BrewDoggy. This bad boy is a full-tilt fruit IPA machine and 7.2% ABV because we're men. And alcoholics. Best part? It's low in bitterness, high on haze, and heavy on hops. Garage grade four and a quarter bottle caps out of five. And here's a cheers to some of our garage friends that are high on haze. First up... We like the cut of your jib goes out to Lenifer in Peterborough, Ontario, Canada. And a big shout out to Santos in Plano, Texas. A big cheers to J-Rob in Los Angeles. And a big we like your jib to Robin and Maddie in Nashville, Georgia. Next, here's a cheers to Girl Spit in Tacoma. And last but certainly not least, we have a cheers to longtime listener Laura Moonstruck from Hidden Valley Lake. Is that where they make the ranch dressing? So a big Ron Swanson please and thank you goes out to everyone who contributed to the beer fund or bought a shirt or any of our other fabulous items from our garage sale at truecrimegarage.com. And we're restocking the store, so check out truecrimegarage.com. Go to the store page and get you some. That's enough of the business. All right, everybody gather around, grab a chair, grab a beer. Let's talk some true crime. When we left off yesterday, Captain, we were talking about the initial investigation and how it started to stall out. Now, that was 20 years ago, almost to the day that Jennifer Metternich was found dead in the Long Branch Creek. Over the years, there has been several efforts to reinvigorate the investigation and kind of kickstart this thing one more time. In 2006, we have playing cards that were released in 2006 a deck of playing cards featuring cold cases was released the two of diamonds was jennifer's card her photo general case information and where to report any information that you may have were all on jennifer's card tips did come in but sadly the tips generated from this tactic so far in the jennifer menonick case led nowhere. In 2013, 
the case got a little movement. This was in May of 2013 when the Clay County deputies and the FDLE, the Florida Department of Law Enforcement, searched a home at 200 McLeland Road for possible evidence relating to Jennifer's murder. It's not clear whether this was pursuant to a tip that they received or what, in fact, led the investigators to this property, but we do know that it was searched. The home was about two miles away from where Jennifer's body was eventually found. From my understanding, Captain, the short version of the result of this search was that nothing was located in the home related to the case. Well, what's interesting in this case is when Jennifer went missing from her home, we have a lot of eyewitnesses around the park that saw her. So we have this knife handle. That is a piece of evidence that the police can go around and say, does anybody in this tight knit community, they're all like really close together. Mm -hmm. Has anybody ever seen this knife before? Yeah, because they have the handle for it. They are referring to it as a unique item. It doesn't look to me to be particularly expensive, but that doesn't mean that it's particularly common. Right. So you're right. This is a, um, like a, a gold color, brass color, metal looking handle that they could at least go around with a picture of asking, is this something that you've seen before? This is not a small item, right? This is not the kind of knife that you're putting in your pocket and walking around with. This is kind of picture Rambo, right? Survival knife type situation where this is going to be, I, I don't want to say a, a foot in length from from the butt to the, the point, but it's going to be a, a, a rather decent size item here. In December of 2013, the Clay County dive teams decided that they were going to combine a training exercise with an additional search effort for more evidence in the stream where Jennifer was found. So they ended up using sophisticated underwater metal detectors that could penetrate the two feet of silt that lay at the bottom of the water. They were looking for the knife blade, of course, and any right. other potential evidence in Jennifer's case. They did not find the knife blade. They did recover some items. These items were a padlock and a pocket knife. But law enforcement say that these items are not believed to be related in any way to their investigation or the murder. Well, that answers my question, because initially when they find the handle under her body, my my question was maybe the blade broke off. And I hate to be graphic, but maybe the blade broke off inside of Jennifer. That's very possible. And with no autopsy report, we can't confirm that but but with this extra dive and what they're looking for we can confirm it wasn't found inside jennifer in case you haven't figured it out so far a little spoiler alert here jennifer's case is unsolved 20 years ago this week in jacksonville florida someone killed this 14 year old girl and now as we approach this 20 year marker we can only hope that this case does not continue to remain unsolved and unresolved yeah Maybe we can turn up the heat a little bit on someone. Yeah, get hot in the hot tub. Because I hope that the person responsible knows that there are plenty of people on this case that are not going to give up. Law enforcement has told us that this case is solvable and will be solved. So let's take a quick look-see at some suspects who are either being considered or were considered at one time in this case. Now, my thoughts are, Captain, that basically we have what I believe would be our two highest of probabilities here. Right. Basically two choices for who killed Jennifer or where we're going to find this individual or individuals. Either someone in the trailer park attacked and killed this still naive and vulnerable teen, possibly even grooming her or after grooming her, or someone outside of the trailer park, maybe even a stranger, was responsible here. So we have to consider the possibility, however remote it may be, that Jennifer fell victim to an opportunistic killer. If she left Woodland Estates and walked off on her own... Yeah, and we have the report 
of her being seen leaving Woodland Estates. Then anyone could have killed her. I mean, perhaps she accepted a ride from a stranger wanting to head to downtown Jacksonville or got talked into going somewhere or getting into the vehicle. Well, a piece of evidence that we have that I'd like to know more about and I think is really kind of the crux of this case is this possible engagement ring. Mm -hmm. Because to me, if it is a, a possible engagement ring or even a promise ring or just a gift in a romantic gesture. Or someone trying to woo her. To me, that, that leans more towards the idea that Jennifer knew her her murderer intimately. Yes, knew her murderer and, I mean, even if how brief we cannot say. Right, but again, it could be so simple that she found this on the ground or that she, when she was couch surfing, that she maybe stole some items. And that's something that law enforcement can figure out pretty easy, figure out who she was staying with. But again, we have that problem because some people aren't stating that, oh, well, yeah, she slept on my couch because I'm an adult man and I don't even want to admit to that. But they could go around and say, who did she stay with? Is there any items missing? And again, this is just like the knife handle. Mm -hmm. This is an item that you can now go around to the community and say, have you seen this before? So two things. I couldn't find a definitive statement of anyone saying anywhere that this ring is something that appeared on her after she left her mom's house. But I have to believe that it is with the way that it's worded and stated in some of these reports. But what is not also readily available, and if anyone can find this out there and can confirm that it is from Jennifer's case, this is a call to action for sending this to us or, or posting a link of the picture on our blog at truecrimegarage.com. Exactly what the captain just said. We have a nice visual, a picture of the knife handle that was found, the murder weapon handle that was found. We don't have a nice visual or picture of this quote unquote engagement ring. And you're exactly right, Captain. This is something that you could be taking around. What we don't have, you know, we, we talk about maybe she could have stolen it from someone or someone gave it to her for reasons that are not evil deeds at all. But we don't have anybody coming forward saying, yes, I gave that to her or, oh, I, I did see her briefly and I was, I'm missing some jewelry and that's a piece that I'm missing. Right. And look, it could, it could also be just one of our friends going, oh, she ran away from home. She's going through a hard time. I'm going to steal this from my parents. And, and maybe they, those people have nothing to do with her murder, but you could see why they wouldn't want to come forward. Uh, especially, I guess, but I, I don't know why you wouldn't want to help in a situation where you're not guilty of anything. No, I understand that. But and I, a but, 14 year old was murdered. No, I understand that. But I also think that if maybe some time passed, I could see an individual with maybe has a bad history just going, I, I, I don't want to look, we, we've seen a lot of cold cases where a couple years go by and nothing is moving and, and the law enforcement gets a little string and they keep pulling and pulling, even if they're going in the r wrong direction. They just keep because they feel on some level we have to blame this on somebody. So I, I, I could see somebody, you know, maybe realizing a couple of years after the fact, all that that ring is somehow related to us. Uh, and I don't want to come forward because I don't want to be possibly thrown under the bus. And where my mind goes is when you have this ring that that's on her person found on her person, mind you, she's not clothed when found. So there's not a lot of items found with her or on her at the time when you find her murdered and this item on her, and this is something she didn't have in her possession to anyone's knowledge before she quote went missing. Then this is important to her murder. This item is part of the murder investigation until you can explain it away and rule it out as not being anything to do with the murder. Now, what we have here when we review the possibilities of a killer known to the victim or a killer unknown to the victim, we do have to consider the fact that she was 14 years old and 
could be called a runaway if you want to. And sometimes, you know, 14 year old runaways get ideas that are not founded in rational thinking. And there was one suspected serial killer who was looked at in Jennifer's case. And so we do have to at least explore the idea. And we know that law enforcement explored the idea that there was a possibility that maybe she did leave the mobile home park and got into somebody's vehicle. So the suspect that I'm talking about has never been entirely ruled out in this case. So News 4 Jacksonville reported one year after Jennifer's murder, the following, that the Clay County Sheriff's Office has confirmed to Channel 4 at that time that they were looking at Richard Avonitz as a possible suspect in the murder of 14-year-old Jennifer Metternich earlier this year. So who is this Richard Avonitz? He is an individual that abducted a 15-year-old girl in South Carolina in June of 2002. He raped her and physically abused her in other ways, but she managed to escape. And then she goes to police. So the way that I this works, this, this portion of what he's guilty of works, is he pulls up, he sees this 15-year-old girl in her front yard, pulls up street side, says that he's selling magazines. She approaches the vehicle, and once she's close enough to maybe view these magazines, if they even existed at all, he pulls a gun, and at gunpoint, he orders her into his vehicle. From there, he takes her back to his apartment where she's restrained and assaulted. This is like the twisted psychological torture stuff that some of these guys really get off on. Right. He made her or, or sat with her and watched the, that night's news to see if there were, if they were going to report her missing or if there was any reports of her missing. She says that he, he goes into the other room. She's handcuffed, but at some point he falls asleep and she can hear him snoring. So she knows that he's asleep. This is when she manages to get out of the handcuffs, flee the apartment, and go off and get some help. Well, she's able to tell the police the apartment where she was kept, even though just briefly for you know some hours. So they know who this dude is, and he must have got up, discovered rather quickly that she's gone. He decides he takes off. So police are out on the lookout for this dude. They put an an APB out for Avonitz. He's then spotted sometime later in Sarasota, Florida, where police tracked him down. There was an armed standoff that ensued, which ended when Avonitz shot himself in the head. The Navy Times wrote a great piece about this incident. One portion of it reads as follows. Quote, trapped by a half dozen cops with guns drawn on a dark Florida highway as a police dog's teeth sank into his ankle, Richard Mark Avonitz put the muzzle of a 45 caliber handgun in his mouth and pulled the trigger, end quote. Well, this guy was a giant piece of shit, but if you look up Richard, he looks like the dad next door. We see this from time to time where we bring up a serial killer and you Google search him and you go, that guy looks like a monster. That guy is nothing behind those eyes. Now, what's interesting about a lot of Richard's pictures is it remember when we talked about uh, we talked to that one private investigator and she talked about just the black eyes. It's like everything about him looks normal, but it's almost like he has these really like dark, dead, nothing eyes. People often say when they encounter one of these individuals that there seems to be nothing behind the eyes. Yeah. Isn't that kind of a trait of like a psychopath where you feel like they're constantly looking through you and not at you? Well, his death did not conclude the investigation into him personally, right? Since now it was evident that he was a predator and a child rapist. The Navy Times goes on to say the single gunshot brought a quick death to the 38-year-old Navy veteran, but only started the questions of what he did in his life. 
So the FBI requested that anyone who knew Ivanitz during his time in the Navy to please contact the FBI. Uh, per the Jacksonville 4 news station that we quoted earlier, Clay and Duval counties were two of, they were just two of 20 police agencies that were examining unsolved crimes from the times that Ivanitz was in or known to be in their areas. In the 80s and early 1990s, Ivanitz was a Navy sonar technician. He was stationed aboard the SS Kolsch from 1985 to 1989 out of Naval Station Mayport in Jacksonville, Florida. So he's familiar with this area. In 1987, in what is now known to be his first offense, let's right underline that, first known offense, right. it's believed that we do not know the full extent of this man's crimes or possibly even his murders. So in this 1987 offense, he drove up to a young girl and started, this is, this is disgusting, he drove up to a young girl and started masturbating near her. She ran off crying and a neighbor wrote down the license plate number before Ivanitz drove away. After he was caught, he pled no contest to a felony of lewd and lascivious conduct in front of a minor. Per the Navy Times, according to a police report from the 1987 arrest, Ivanitz told investigators that he had, an, he had a habit of driving around, spotting a young girl, preferably a brunette, catching her attention, and then masturbating. For this incredibly disgusting hobby, Ivanitz got three years probation. At this same time, he was separately undergoing treatment for drug and alcohol addiction. Now, none of this was apparently enough to get him kicked out of the Navy, which Navy officials later admitted it should have. In fact, he went on to receive some good conduct medals for before leaving the Navy in 1992. You whip it out, we lock you up. You know what they say, click it or tick it, right? Zip it or tick it. I don't care what anybody says. You know how disturbing it would be for these females to come up walking wherever and you see a guy just, you know, beating it as if it owes them money. That person, there should be no probation. There should be at least some minimal minimum jail time. After his time in the Navy, Avonitz worked a series of jobs in Virginia and South Carolina, including a job at a machine shop uh, where he was an employee in Virginia from 1995 to 1999. Then his home was foreclosed and he moved to South Carolina where he was originally from. And here's where it gets, I guess, in, I guess interesting is what we're going to say. When the police raided Avonitz's home, after that 2002 rape of the South Carolina girl and then his suicide when they cornered him, they found some interesting stuff. It was evidence possibly linking him to the kidnapping and murder of three girls in Virginia where he was living at the time of their murders. So this would be the 1996 to 1997 time frame. These were sisters Kristen and Katie Lisk and a girl named Sophia Silva. The clues found included newspaper articles about the murders and handwritten notes mapping out the areas where the victims lived. We're not going to get into the weeds on these murders here because we're talking about Jennifer's case, but these Murders, of course, were unsolved at the time, at 2002, when they found these items in his apartment. But the FBI called Avonitz a strong suspect in the Lisk and Silva cases. And boy, were they right. Because after his death, analysis showed that hair from Richard Avonitz matched hairs found on the bodies of all three girls and blue acrylic fibers from a pair of furry handcuffs right. he owned were gathered from the three victims. Perhaps the most damning evidence was a palm print and fingerprints matching Kristen Lisk found from the inside of the trunk of a Vonnet's car. These were found five years after the abduction. 
The local sheriff, Ronald Knight, cried as he announced the incredible break in the case and the end of the exhaustive search for the man who committed these horrible crimes. This show is sponsored by BetterHelp. Do you look forward to the holidays? Maybe you struggle with seasonal blues. This time of year can be a lot, and it's natural to feel some sadness or even anxiety about it. But adding something new and positive to your life can counteract some of those feelings. Therapy can be a bright spot, something to look forward to, to make you feel grounded, and to give you the tools to manage everything going on. If you're thinking of starting therapy, give BetterHelp a try. It's entirely online, designed to be convenient, flexible, and suited to your schedule. Just fill out a brief questionnaire to get matched with a licensed therapist and switch therapist at any time for no additional charge. Find your bright spot this season with BetterHelp. Visit BetterHelp.com slash garage today to get 10% off your first month. That's BetterHelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash garage. Rosetta Stone is the language learning program with a lasting impact. I've been using their app to learn French, and it's not just about memorizing words, but actually having real conversations. And it's not just French. They offer 25 languages. Right now, Rosetta Stone has an awesome holiday deal, 50% off their lifetime membership. Every language, unlimited access forever. For anyone keen on diving deep into a new language, check out rosettastone.com. It's a game changer. Major phone carriers make you sign contracts with rigid data plans to trap you into a kind of forced phonogamy. Sounds pretty insecure if you ask me. At Consumer Cellular, we believe in a more consensual and healthy form of phonogamy, free of contracts and more flexible to your data needs. This way, you stick around not because we force you to with contracts and fees, but because you love our phone plans. Like ardently love our phone plans. Phonogamously. Consumer Cellular. When Freedom calls, we're here to answer. Call us at 1-888-FREEDOM. All right, we are back. Cheers, everybody. Make sure you're following us on social media, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. You can find us at True Crime Garage. Cheers to you, the crispiest of the colonels. Extra crispy colonel here. Cheers to you, Captain. And you know what else we like? A little five-star review with a nice little write-up. Makes my day. I was going to say drugs. (laughs) And Old Richard Ivanitz. I'd love to break his legs off, shove him up his ass, and then shit down his throat. Well, good news. You won't have to do any of that because, as said, the police surrounded him. The dogs are biting into his legs, and he's he decided to end it for us. Now, that can be good. That can be bad. It's bad for some of these investigations. It seems to me pretty cut and dried, right, that this guy is guilty of these three murders. But what else is he guilty of? Well, he's also guilty of the abduction of Kara Robinson, but she got free. And then once it's brought to light what this creep was up to, you know, neighbors recalled Avonitz as someone who had an unhealthy interest in young girls. And believe you me, this seems like an understatement. So what is it that connects Richard Avonitz to Jennifer Metternach? Not a whole heck of a lot, but there is enough to be intriguing. First, Ivanitz lived in Clay County, where Jennifer's body was eventually found. He lived there in the late 80s, and then after his death in 2002, from the Jacksonville Sheriff's Office, Lieutenant Rick Graham said, quote, We do have a connection of him being in this city in the late 80s. We will be going back to that time period and looking to see if there's possibilities that Mr. Ivanitz could be connected to any unsolved murders back in that era. Now, it's worth noting that they do not have specific information or did not at that time that Ivanitz was in the Jacksonville area in the year of 2001 when Jennifer was killed. The last time he was known to be in that city was more than a decade beforehand. 
But Ivanitz traveled around a lot, as we've already pointed out. Neighbors reported that he had an unhealthy interest in prepubescent girls, and by his own admission, Ivanitz was into young brunette girls. Further, the murders of Sophia Silva and sisters Katie and Kristen Lisk bear a similarity to Jennifer's case. Here's some information from the Navy Times. See if you can discern why we've included these cases and why these cases would be of interest to Jennifer Metternich's investigators. Silva, 16 years old, disappeared from her front porch on September 16th, 1997. Her body was found days later, wrapped in a blanket near an area creek. Katie, 12, and Kristen, 15, were abducted from the front yard of their home on May 1st, 1997. Their bodies were found in a nearby river just days later. So, pretty obvious, right? Here, Captain, where we have our victim, Jennifer Madanek, that was known to be or believed to be still in the area in her general neighborhood and then later found in a creek. Similar situation with all three of these girls that ranged in age from 12 to 16. And of course, Jennifer fits right in the middle of those ages. Avonitz, who was intimately familiar with the area where Jennifer was found, liked to murder brunette teen girls and then dump them in or near waterways. Now, that's not enough, of course, to connect him to Jennifer's case. Right. And at least two of his other victims were strangled, not stabbed. But we do know from the abduction that he was also known to use a gun. So he's he's not wedded to the use of just one type of weapon. Right. And because he also, these could be crimes of opportunity, so it could just be whatever he has on him at the time. Both of these crimes, the three murders together, they do appear to me to be crimes of opportunity and we have his own admission to police saying that he would drive around looking for girls well let me throw out one thing that might just seem very obvious but in this case like we know when she leaves her mother's house we have multiple eyewitnesses to say where she went afterwards or that they saw her Mm -hmm. and we believe them because the story checks out Mm -hmm. so to me The idea that she left the park, because we have eyewitness accounts of this, to me, this is information that we should believe because the other eyewitnesses' accounts were correct. She was seen leaving the park. The interesting thing to me here, Captain, is we don't know the the details of this, but we do have the statement from police that she was at a party, right? And so several of these eyewitnesses could have been at the same party. And I want to know exactly when this party took place, because is she there at this party talking to her peers and kind of filling them in on her whereabouts or what she's been up to since she's left mommy's house? Right. So these would be statements that they're later able to pass along to the sheriff's department. And as you pointed out, they're probably backed up by other witnesses statements. Right. If Avonitz did kill Jennifer, Long story short, he took that secret with him to his grave. But I think what we should do here is circle back to our other idea that someone closer to home, someone that likely knew Jennifer, even no matter how brief, and the killer could have been someone that she possibly trusted. So let's look at what evidence we have that the killer was someone who resided or spent time in Woodland Estates. The original investigator on the case, remember this is a 20-year-old case here, was Lieutenant Jim Redman, who was a seasoned, dedicated law enforcement officer. He said publicly after the murder that he believed that Jennifer's killer was, quote, from the area. He told the Times Union and went on to say, quote, the fact of the matter is she didn't run away from her community. It was more of an issue of frequent curfew violations. We believe she was still right in the community where she lived. This case will get solved right in that area where she lived. End quote. So clearly, 
police were looking at someone close to home. But like you said, almost to the day, this is a 20-year-old case. Mm -hmm. And when you have a case that's gone on that long, you have peaks and valleys. When you get new information, maybe you then reach out to the public, try to get people talking, and then you have lulls where just nothing, new information is not coming in. You're not getting any tips. It's hard to work the case in those scenarios. But through the whole time, we believe law enforcement had some suspects that they were always working on. Yeah, and it looks to me, Captain, like Clay County has about five unsolved homicides in this time span. So they have a good success rate when it comes to solving similar types of crimes and similar types of cases. And what you're going to see here is even though they're not announcing everything publicly, there seems to have been a lot that was going on behind the scenes in this particular case. And we catch a little wind of that from a statement from 2015. This was Lieutenant Wayne McKinney, of Clay County Sheriff's Office, who supervised its robbery slash homicide slash special victims division. He said, we actually had some suspects over the years that we have talked to. We've had some persons of interest that we've definitely been interested in. Who was he talking about? Well, detectives believe and still believe that Jennifer was killed by someone from Woodland Estates. Cold case detective Rob Schoonover kind of backs up a lot of this thought here, who he told us as intriguing as the Richard Avonitz lead seems, we got to go back to the very beginning and that investigators were convinced very early on that Jennifer was killed by someone from her neighborhood. And he said that they were able to gather credible information regarding specific individuals at the mobile home park. So here's what I was able to piece together here, Captain, in in this regard. We know that Jennifer was hanging around the Woodland Estates. Well, she was very unwisely hanging around with the wrong crowd. And this is per her mother's statements, per law enforcement's statements as well. Now, we figured out that there was a large party scene in Woodland Estates. And as we stated earlier, it was pretty shady. There was one home in particular where impressionable young people, this is both boys and girls, teenagers, this includes underage kids who were Jennifer's peers, where they went to hang out. And this was to drink, possibly do drugs, and maybe even have all sorts of sexual liaisons. The home was toward the front of of the park and was occupied by two guys in their early twenties. Either they had a liking for young girls or couldn't manage to pick up women of their own age. And they're housing these underage parties frequently in their trailer. A little birdie has told us that Jennifer was involved with one of them and the relationship did involve drugs and sex. It's possible that she was groomed by these guys or one of the guys in particular giving her drugs or tempting her with drugs. Maybe one of these guys gave her that ring that was found later. Maybe even promised that he loved her in some way. Through police interviews with people in the trailer park, they learned that several other guys may have had some type of romantic exchange with Jennifer. Now, mind you, we shouldn't have to point this out, but this is a 14 year old girl. So these guys are all essentially pedophiles. Anyway, investigators gathered that Jennifer had been hanging out at this sketchy party home in the time that she was quote missing. Now through secondhand statements, we learned that witnesses said that they saw Jennifer And she was last seen getting into a pickup truck owned by one of these guys. This on Wednesday. Remember, her body was found on Thursday. Right. So witnesses seen Jennifer getting into a pickup truck owned by one of these guys on Wednesday and leaving Woodland Estates in the company of the two party guys from the mobile home. On Thursday, her body was found. These two predators, the last people known to have been seen with Jennifer, our victim, are Gregory Allen Giffen and David Michael Getz. 
These names have never been released publicly before that we know of. Now, even though investigators knew that Getz and Giffen were their guys, when they brought them in for questioning, they ran into some trouble here. What we have is that Giffen gives a sworn statement that he was present when Jennifer was murdered by his friend, David Michael Getz. But then he retracted this statement and then kept flip-flopping on his story. And the state's attorney decided that given the unreliability of this discredited statement against Getz, even though authorities believe Giffen and Getz are in fact responsible for Jennifer's murder, there was not enough to proceed with charges at that time. So one piece of shit says, hey, this other piece of shit, he's responsible. And then when they come back, he says, oh, no, 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 no. I changed my mind. The old waffling, the old flip-flopping. Yes, but we've also seen people be interrogated and throw somebody under the bus that is innocent. Well, investigators talking with people at the Woodland Estates in the days after Jennifer's murder found out that Getz was seen cleaning out his truck the day after Jennifer was killed. He washed it down and cleaned out the inside, potentially eradicating possible evidence. And Jennifer's clothes, her clothing was never found, and neither was the knife blade. So other than the witness statements that Jennifer was involved with one of the guys, or one of these guys, that she had been hanging out in their trailer when her mom was looking for her, and that she had been seen in Getz's truck with the both of them, and then had turned up dead the next day, there was nothing concrete beyond that to go on. Apparently, our boy Giffen is in prison in Oklahoma and has been visited by the investigating agency, trying to persuade him to talk, but the inmate would not cooperate. Giffen and Getz have never been charged with Jennifer's murder. Well, maybe somebody from this park knows that one of these turd bags owned the knife or possibly owned this ring that they gave to Jennifer. Jennifer's mom died of a heart attack in 2011, but luckily Clay County's cold case investigator, David Schoonover, is still seeking justice in her case. There has been some good news in the case. The state's attorney's office has decided to take another look at Jennifer's case. Representatives from that office collected all of the files from Clay County homicide and are reviewing the file. Detective Schoonover tells us that they believe Giffen and Getz are guilty, and he is hopeful that they will decide to press charges for Jennifer's murder. Old Giffen and Getz sounds like a record company from the 20s. One of them confess before. Maybe one of them would confess again. But it's been 20 years. And let me remind you of this statement, this statement by law enforcement. This was a 14-year-old girl who was brutally murdered and dumped into the creek like a piece of trash. And she was murdered by pieces of trash. And people saw her walking around, talking with people, hanging out with people, and possibly be, being at a party. Somebody has seen more or heard more or maybe one of these scumbags, Giffen or Getz, has told somebody something. And somebody out there has information. And they've been holding on to this information for quite a long time. Justice needs to be served. And you, if you know something, you need to say something. And you need to contact law enforcement. Well, and maybe you're an eyewitness or an ear witness to something during that time period when she was away from home leading up to her death. Or maybe you've heard something or been told something since then in the last 20 years. And it was something that was a little confusing to you, but now hearing the names, knowing the names, Gregory Allen Giffen and David Michael Getz, maybe that picture becomes a little clearer to you. And maybe you now have a better understanding of what it was that you heard or something that you may have seen all those years ago. It's not too late to inform law enforcement about what you know. They still, if you don't have direct information regarding the murder itself, 
or the moving of the body or the disposal of her body, they still want to fill in the blanks on that timeline from the time that she left her mother Angie's home to the time that she ended up in Long Branch Creek. In one of the more recent articles about Jennifer's homicide and the ongoing investigation, this was titled Unsolved, the Murder of Jennifer Metternich by Catherine Jeffries. In the article, Detective Shunover says, I know some people are out there with knowledge and for whatever reason are not coming forward. But you have to look at this 14-year-old girl. She didn't deserve to die like this. The wounds that you could see during the autopsy, it was very gruesome. But the way she died, it was a horrible and tragic death for her to have to go through. Again, Jennifer Metternich's life was brutally ended in November of 2001. Her body was found dumped under a small bridge in a desolate area along County Road 217. The evidence at the scene indicates the body was probably dumped off of the bridge. This is just one of a handful of unsolved murder cases in Clay County. Detective Ron Schoonover with the Clay County Sheriff's Office primarily focus is bringing closure to these cold cases. So he is reopening this cold case. Again, if you have any information, whether you think it's big or small, it could be a very little detail that could help law enforcement. If you know something, say something. On November 5th, 2001, Jennifer's mother reported her missing, reported her daughter missing. We need to fill in the blanks on that timeline because three days later, her body was found in that creek 11 miles away from home. Detectives believe that she bled to death after receiving multiple stab wounds. Underneath her body, investigators found the handle of a knife with strands of Jennifer's hair. Of course, they believe this is the murder weapon. So any information about the knife itself is crucial and important. Also remember her clothing. The items that she was last seen wearing, brown sandals, green and black shorts, and a white t-shirt with red lips on it, have never been found either. And the knife handle was just one of several pieces of evidence collected from the scene. Evidence the Clay County Sheriff's Office says they are resubmitting for DNA testing. And as we know, there are people who law enforcement is looking at, looking at are looking very at. closely. In fact, Detective Schoonover says to this day, there are a couple of individuals that are persons of interest and high on the list. And he firmly believes there are people who know more than what they told detectives in 2001. Quote, I know some people are out there with knowledge and for whatever reason, are not coming forward. A special thanks goes out to Clay County Sheriff's Office for their hard work and continued efforts on this now 20-year-old case. And kudos to Katie Jeffries for her great reporting, keeping Jennifer's case and others in the spotlight in efforts to spread awareness of these cases and reminding the public that law enforcement needs your help. If you know something, say something, if anyone listening knows anything at all about the murder of Jennifer Metternich in 2001, even if you think it's something of no importance or significance, please contact the Clay County Sheriff's Office and let them decide if your tip could help. Anyone with information should call the Clay County Sheriff's Office at 904-264-6512. Thank you so much for joining us here in the garage and keeping this little garage show afloat. We would be nothing if it weren't for you. Colonel, do we have any recommended reading for this week? This week we are recommending Amy, My Search for Her Killer by a longtime friend of the show, James Renner. Last week, 32 years ago, was the day that Amy Mahalovic was abducted from Bay Village, Ohio. I want to give a shout out and high praise to everybody that participated in the walk for Amy last week. Check out James Renner's book, Amy, My Search for Her Killer. You can also find our case coverage for the Amy Mahalovic case on episodes 22, 308, 309, 345, 346, and episode 463. 
So we've been covering this case for the past five years. Check out that recommendation and many others on truecrimegarage.com. And until next week, be good, be kind, and don't litter. Angie's list is now Angie, and we've heard a lot of theories about why. I thought it was an eco-move. Fewer words, less paper. No, it was so you could say it faster. No, it's to be more iconic. Must be a tech thing. But those aren't quite right. It's because now you can compare upfront prices, book a service instantly, and even get your project handled from start to finish. Sounds easy. It is, and it makes us so much more than just a list. Get started at Angie.com. That's A-N-G-I. Or download the app today.